Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 536, featuring an interview that I've wanted to have on this show for years, decades. <laughs> uh, namely, Michael A. Stackpole. Uh, now this is a name you're probably familiar with if you've played the Wasteland series, uh, or you like to read, because he's uh, written some of the best uh, Star Wars novels out there, a lot of great novels in the Battletech universe, he's done comics, uh, he's uh, done a lot of work with role-playing game, whether we're talking tabletop stuff like Tunnels and Trolls and his own Mercenary Spies and Private Eyes series, uh, but he's also done lots of work with uh, video and computer games, as you will soon see. He's also a pioneer in the field of electronic publishing, and he's he knows a lot about a lot of stuff. <laughs> he's, a, he's a really good storyteller to boot. Kind of big shocker there, uh, considering his resume. Uh, anyway, I'm really excited about this, and I think you'll really love this uh, interview. So without further ado, here is Mr. Michael A. Stackpole. Hmm, like the mustache. Yeah, I'm sort of, you know, having fun playing around with it, so. I used to have the, use wax to kind of curl it around. The... Right, right. Barbershop style. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just, I, you know, pretty much anything a writer does can be considered research. So, yeah. so that's what I'm deciding this is. Well, there you go. Yeah, you've got, well, first of all, thank you for doing this. It's a real honor for to get sure. to sit down with you, have a chat with you. I mean, my God, the stuff you've worked on. You know, I feel like this should be a trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know we might be able to get a six-part series of it, so I don't know. Uh, I thought we could start. I was going to show people your uh, your your scratch, right? Yeah, it's just I was just before we got on. I was reading your uh, story in here about the fixers. I think it's till death do we part, something like. Oh that. yeah, 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 yeah. Like <laughs> yeah, a lot of fun. I I really relate to the main character on that. Just holes in his memory. <laughs> yep. Hey, so you want to talk a little bit about what this is all about here? Sure. Um, you know, as as many people have done, uh, you know, I've got a Patreon project, and <laughs> uh, I would say monthly, but I, it's every month that I've got something that I can put out there, I'll put out a story and uh, you know a bunch of fiction, um, and then for uh, uh, the uh, for those who want to see how it's done, uh, I do. Um, uh, I've got the watch me work um, level where not only do they get to see the finished fiction, uh, but they also get to see previous drafts. Um, generally, I do a breakdown of why I did certain things certain ways. Um, so it's kind of an educational uh, uh, educational moment. Oh. Um, so in that case, with with that particular story, uh, with the fixers, you'd get a lot of the background. You'd get um, actually, I think in there, I had you'd done some of that before, but there was a lot more material uh, talking about, um, you know, just the development of what I wanted to do with characters and things like that. So that's really amazing. And, and as I recall, with that one, there also was what the original outline was, and then you get to read the story and see where it is not at all like the original outline. Um, which is kind of standard uh, for uh, you know what we do. So. Yeah, I was gonna say. I always tell I'm a writing uh, professor by trade, so I was, I'm probably gonna share some of this with my my students in there because I have a game studies course, mm -hmm. but then also just have some regular writing courses too. And and you know, one of the things we emphasize is the, the drafting. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know how many iterations and versions the story goes through and. You know, they had this idea that a professional author just sits down and cranks it out in one one fell swoop, right? No, I think it's it's when you look at it. When you look at, um, I mean, all of us have seen the "This is how you draw Marvel superheroes" or "This is how you draw anything," and <laughs> um, you'll see very rough sketch, and then it'll get defined. And that rough sketch, artists will refer to as as the finding lines, where they're sort of defining space and kind of narrowing down what they want to do. And and the drafts in fiction or the drafts in a game design are very much the same thing. Those are those finding lines, and just all of that gets erased, and all you see is is uh, is the final product. Uh, you know, you never see the stuff that never made the uh, never made the cut. So, yeah, and you've been doing this for. Quite a while. I was 
have you uh do you look at your wikipedia page uh not very often um, no i'm assuming it's, it's there's a lot of interesting stuff on here uh but it was talking about how you were one of the earliest people to do electronic publishing and you had uh, well i was i on. was the first guy on uh on uh the apple app store yeah i mean so. <laughs> yeah, i'd love to hear some more about that and how that's evolved over time oh yeah 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 ebooks have evolved incredibly um i mean back oh, 15 years ago i think i was doing was the co-host of a uh, podcast called dragon page uh cover to cover and we would interview we would interview authors but it was also during the time when um the kindle was just coming out and people were just having to grasp uh, try and get a handle on what this was going to mean for writers and what this was going to mean for publishing in general um and uh, uh michael menengay and i both on that show were big proponents of electronic books just because of the idea and i think at that time i was you know carrying around a palm pilot um you know but but you could have books in there and you could be reading uh on your uh, on your palm pilot and i i remember very uh, uh definitely and any number of uh, callers we would have uh calling in would just say no i'm never giving up my books and what we would point out is physical books will still sell but they're probably going to be sold like um, souvenirs uh you know you read the book in electronic form because it's going to be less expensive if you really like it you get a physical copy as a keepsake to keep on your shelf to get signed and certainly over the last 10 years you know going to shows uh having tables selling books which you know, never used to do at the start of my career um nobody did um i mean if you were selling books at a convention by yourself your your career had failed because wow. you know it was like you were selling stuff out of your garage and and now um it is exactly that people buying souvenir copies of of books uh it's it's just amazing i can, I can see that you know, I go to comic book conventions and things of that sort, and I always see some some local novelists as well as professional creators out there. And it's always, always, <laughs> you know, I have infinite money, but I always try to buy at least one thing from each person. Just you never sure. know, right? And you can get it signed, and it's just that kind of personal uh, experience it makes it a lot more fun for me to read something if I if I know the author. Oh yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I remember when uh, I used to be one of those people, Michael. This like no. You know, I, I'm very traditional. <laughs> it just give me the paper, the smell of the paper, the feel of the page, and all of this. Right. And I, I held off forever, and finally, uh, Amazon was always doing those, uh, you know, crazy deals they have every so often. The sure, I forget what Black Friday sales or something like that. And mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> I'll buy one of these Kindles and you know, see what it's see what it's all about. And I don't. Sure. It took me about five minutes, and I'm like, okay. I'm not going back to paper. No, it, 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 I find it, you know, addictive. And I have, uh, I, I read off of the iPad, uh, mostly because I just have a, I have an Apple architecture here in the house. Mm -hmm. Um, but that is primarily where I do, uh, all of my reading and, and half of my writing, uh, will be on the, on the devices. Uh, oh. cause they're just, they're so convenient. Um, that's a nice it's, point. Uh, so you could write on the same device that you're going to be reading the published absolutely. form. That's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. And matter of fact, I mean, to the point where in doing research, uh, you can pull the PDFs or the EPUBs of these books that have been scanned in. You can mark them up. You can take notes. Hmm. Uh, and you've got that um, to be able to draw into uh, your writing. Um, so again, unbelievably convenient. I need to figure out how to do this because I I've got actually quite a bit of stack pole here. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> the Kindle already, but yeah, I put the I got your uh, Rogue uh, Squadron book and your uh, Conan mm -hmm. book. Got those, uh, but then I was wondering, there's probably some way I can get the Scratch into the device as well. Is that possible? 
Yeah, I mean they're they're just PDFs. I think you can you can port PDFs over. Uh, because I don't have a Kindle. I have I've got a Kindle, but I've got a Kindle Fire someone gave me. Well, maybe I should get uh, the so the iPad's a better experience than the Kindle. Uh, I've found for me for for what I use, especially because I travel a lot. Hmm. Uh, for me, the iPad is just more convenient. Um, you know, again, because I've I've been Apple since '88. Uh. I've got a lot of stuff that is compatible that way, uh, backward and forward. So, uh, so that's, that's what I do. And then, you know, I mean, things like being on a plane, um, you know, it's, it's just very convenient to be able to watch movies, um, or to sit down and read and make notes, um, or type or, or, uh, you know, any of that stuff. And, and even to the point again, with that, um, with an iPad or with an iPhone, uh, shoot video if you have to. So, you know, instead of carrying a book with me and a typewriter with me and, and, you know, I, I mean, I, I've been somebody who's lugged around over the years, uh, computers weighing five pounds or more, uh, you know, to go to shows, uh, back before portable computers were really portable. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, it's um, very I'm convenient to have all that in, you know, a, a, uh, something the size of uh eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper i remember those days and it was it was a compact kind of had oh yeah i had no i compact um uh, and osborne and i had osborne, osborne. yeah an osborne yep. yeah that <laughs> like... was 24 pounds that was a monster <laughs> oh my god and and it had a 300 baud modem i mean that baby cook you know <laughs> you could probably type faster than that thing could uh, well yeah transmit data but Wow. So yeah, you got some, you've been doing this for a while. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I was one of the five. I don't know if it does this on the iPad, but when I'm reading the Kindle, every now and then I'll see a passage and it'll be highlighted. Mm -hmm. So like 200 people highlighted this, this passage, you know, and right. I thought that was, you know, it seems like such a little thing, but to me, that's just a really cool kind of brings like a communal aspect to, you know, reading can be feel very uh, solitary and, you know what I mean? It's like, I wish sure. I could almost do more with that sort of whoever came up with that concept. You know, I wish they would do more of that kind of stuff because it'd make it more fun. I, I, I think it is. I think it's it's um, when you look at it, it's probably only been the last 150 years uh, going on 200 years uh, where reading has become uh, a solitary uh, occupation mm -hmm. or uh, occupation uh solitary pastime as opposed to when uh if you had the newspaper in your house in the evening after dinner someone be would be reading to everybody else as they as they darned socks or you know did did whatever they were going to be doing and, you know that was a form of recreation and it was really in uh in england when the steam trains uh, started carrying passengers. So that's the 1840s, I'm guessing, 1830s, 1840s, um, that you had uh, uh, literally what they would do is they would take a big book, they would split it into three parts. Um, the publisher, uh, damn, the name is just escaping. It'll come back. Um, uh, I think this was W.H. Smith. But the publisher would split books into three parts. Uh, the spines would be yellow. And if you were like going from London to Glasgow, you would go and get the first third of Ivanhoe. You would rent it in London. You would drop it off in Glasgow. And then when you're coming back, you rent the second part in Glasgow and you drop it off in London. Um, and of course, if if you you know had a personal library in your house, which not many people could afford, that had yellow spined books, um, then people would know you were stealing books. Um, wow. But uh, but again, you know, this was this the the whole idea that that reading was very much a communal thing. And if you look at books that were written back then, um, they were written in a way that they're very easily read out loud. Mm. And then when we sort of get into the solipsistic uh, reading for yourself, um, I mean, I know I, I've written stories that really were not meant to be read out loud. Uh, because you'll have uh, plays on words that are dealing with uh, uh, homonyms uh, and it works well on the page. 
it doesn't work uh, on uh, uh, it doesn't work when someone's reading it. You know, you have to explain the pun, and then it's not funny anymore. Yeah, I know a lot of writing instructors and theorists, and they they talk a lot about this this the how important it is to read aloud, and that's something that'll help right. you be a better writer and help you to read and you know all this stuff. And I, <laughs> you know, oddly enough, I I, I think about how uh, Dungeons and Dragons. You know, kind of kind of plays a role here because people mm -hmm. are that's one of my you know i played with people and this might be the first time you know they've read anything aloud if they're the you know reading a scenario or a module description and reading aloud to an audience right <laughs> sort of hanging on there you know their words i think that can it's a very powerful thing i always try to get my students to read aloud you know record record themselves listen to it you know see if you because if you get it to sound good it's probably going to be better better writing you know, I, I think one of the real important things about reading the stuff aloud is that you learn to regulate sentence length mm. because you have to take a breath and mentally for whatever reason uh you know if the sentence goes on too long you know mentally you're sitting there going where do i breathe um <laughs> And so it's 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 a really good way, and it also helps you get a feel for the sounds, get a feel for things that are too close or impossible to sound out. I mean, I remember when I was doing the X-Wing novels, uh, the producer would call up when they were doing an audio book of it, and he would have a list of names uh, to ask when are you, you know, how do you pronounce these? And half the words i would just say to him do whatever you want i've never said it out loud i have only typed it uh, um i so know that feeling <laughs> yeah because i mean you read it silently and yes one of the you mentioned audiobooks and that's something i've noticed seems to be picking up i've read some some reports and writers uh, digest type publications and they're saying this is a really vibrant market that's going to be get bigger and bigger the audiobook and you know that's kind right. of I, just kind of dip my toe in the water with this, but you might have some thoughts on that. Yeah, it, it from all the all the things that I've seen, it is becoming a, a lot bigger. Um, you know, if 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 nothing else, one indicator is that when uh, Del Rey uh, uh, Random House uh, re-released the X Wing Star Wars novels as part of the essential Star Wars, uh, they did originally they were abridged audiobooks. And they have done them as the full audio. So they are not, they are unabridged now. And people have been hitting those uh, over and over and over again. Uh, so it is just, you know, the fact that they're going to take a 25 year old book and make it over, spend the money to make it over into a, a full audio just indicates they're seeing uh, a lot of money there. Yeah. That's, you know, I just had the thought. <laughs> this is a great, by the way. Uh, but the I remember one of my first books uh, it was a Star Wars book, but it was a book on it was a tape and book, I think they called it, or a book on tape. Mm -hmm. Remember those? So oh, yeah, like, read it to you and it has sound effects. And then there was like, I think, a blaster with or maybe a lightsaber sound effect for uh, during sure. the page. You know, that's a lot of fun. But yeah, so it looks like you got the audiobook here, twelve ninety nine. Yep. So, so if you get the Kindle, I guess. Does that come with the audio book? I seem like they bundle these sometimes, right? Sometimes they do. I don't think these do. I think for um, uh, oh, Kindle, you. I think for um, Amazon, books published by Amazon, they may do the bundling. So. I think it says, well, I could add it, but it looks like it's the same price. So, Right. And I wish they would just have like, just buy everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know one tar uh one price uh, but yeah, there are some there are some publishers that are doing that um that will uh like some of the game publishers if you buy a physical copy uh you'll get a code to be able to pull down a pdf uh, or an electronic book um that's a good value add you don't buy the I, if this was like thirty dollars and you get the paperback and the kindle and the audio book you know something like that or even 50 bucks you know i know for me, that would be, well, why not? <laughs> you know, then I've oh, got sure. all the options. Yep. I can do whatever well, I like. You know, I remember back in the late 90s, there was a device called the Rocket eBook. And uh, I remember corresponding with the people at um, at Rocket eBooks to try and get them to come over 
and start buying role playing games. Um, and they didn't. They had a they had a very proprietary format, and they had cut deals with the major publishers to do. Um, yep, there you go. Uh, but to do all the best sellers. And, and I remember going back and forth with them, just saying, look, guys, bestsellers are, are great, but nobody's paying that much for a device just for bestsellers. Mm -hmm. Whereas gamers who are already paying tons of money for rules will absolutely buy your device because it is searchable. All of a sudden, you know, if I'm looking up a rule, I can find it just like that. And, uh, and they said, no, no, we're not interested. It's like, oh, guys, you know, you're just, you're, you're missing, you're missing your shot. You know, I feel that way about Kindle books because there's all these, every now and then I get a really well done ebook and it uses a lot of features, you know, like I can oh, click yeah, on yeah. a word and it'll find what, oh, here's what, you know, here's what an X Wing is, you know, something like, right, it's got right. its own sort of built in database. And, like, that's really cool. Why don't they do more with this? <laughs> You know, and somebody like you who's got the uh, uh, the chops. I mean, you were doing those tunnels and trolls mm -hmm. sort of solo uh, adventures. I mean, wouldn't that be great for a sort of ebook experience? Oh, absolutely. I think part of the problem with um, commercial publishers is that while we see the the company as say Random House, they see the company as Random House Young Adult, Random House Fantasy, Random House Science Fiction. And so they break it out there, you know, Random House Gaming. And each one of those is its own little kingdom. And while it makes sense to to us as outsiders to go, why don't we take Random House Ebook, we'll take this piece of it, which really belongs to Random House Gaming, uh, and we'll combine it with this piece we're publishing over here at Random House uh, Fantasy, and we can give you a whole package that will go with your game. You know, it, it, it's it's the problem with corporations. They don't see it that way. You know, it's just not all words. It's words that belong in this box or that box or that box or that box. Um, and again, you know, the cool thing in the gaming industry is that uh, companies are small enough that they can pile all the things into the same box. Um, but with a corporation, that's not... You know, that's not very easy for them to do. They don't have that flexibility. Yeah, I was just thinking, I did a gameplay documentary feature film project one time, and the, mm -hmm. the publisher of that was new, I guess, had done, hadn't done anything with games before, and they kept asking me, well, why don't we? Why don't you see if you could find a game that's about to come out, and we'll see if we can make a bundle deal, you know, with this documentary. And I sure. guess there was nobody was interested. It's like not even a... Couldn't even yep. get anybody on the phone. You know, they just had no conception of, like, well, this is, what does a mo movie have to do with the game? You know, and right. it's, it's almost weird. Like, well, it's, it's, how is this a negative? I mean, this is going to be a win-win for everybody, right? <laughs> it, it, it is, unless you figure out that when you're looking at a corporation, you're looking at the guys whose interest in the corporation whether they publish books or they're making sponges or they're making, you know, uh, snack cakes or whatever, the accounting guys are just interested in making the accounting work. Um, you know, the warehouse guys are interested in making the warehouse work. And if you don't have people that are in a position to, to make these different things work uh, and work together, it's not going to work. I mean, one of the things with eBooks, one of the, one of the uh, problems with eBooks is that you have vice presidents in charge of warehousing. And if you go heavily over into ebooks, suddenly they've got nothing, you know, because they're in charge of the warehouses. But if there's not anything in the warehouses, uh, uh, you know, so that's, and, 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 you know, we've watched with publishing, you know, Random House, even though they've been snapping up everything in the, in the world, used to have, two buildings in new york city uh side by side where their offices were now they only have one of those um you know which great investment for them sell the real estate off and everything like that you know it, it, that's fine but that's just a sign of how much the business changes um i mean it's, it's been as a writer 
uh, who's been doing this since, you know, the 80s anyway. Um, it's fascinating to watch, and it is bloody well terrifying. And then if you study publishing going all the way back to the time of Poe, um, you know, the changes in the business have been doubly, triply terrifying because uh, the, the speed just accelerates. Um, and, and the real, the, the I guess the uh, uh, saving grace there is that um, now because we're in a place where we can do something like Scratch and, and all people who've got Patreon uh, stuff to, to publish their own work and Kickstarter to publish their own work, um, now we're not limited to uh, the distribution systems that we had to worry about. Um, when you look at it, uh, I think it was 1988, if I remember the numbers correctly. 1988 was the first year that more science fiction novels were published in a year than science fiction short stories. So up until 88, from literally, you know, about 1905 up through 88, short stories were the primary method of delivery of science fiction in 88 it turns into novels and that asimov and analog and all those uh, yeah yeah and you and you look at how magazine fast, of fantasy and science fiction i have subscriptions to all of those sure but but you know science fiction used to be published in argosy in short story in blue book in astounding tales amazing stories you know, galaxy, if, I mean, it just went on and on and on. And, and you've watched all of those magazines just retract. And yet now we've got online magazines that can be putting that stuff out. Or you look at, at Battletech, um, you know, Battletech, because of a Kickstarter, decided that they would start a magazine uh, to literally as a, as a stretch goal. And now that magazine is viable and is continuing on its own. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, so it's, but it, I mean, you know, it's 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 terribly funny to watch, you know, things come full circle, you know. Uh, uh, short stories have died off, and now we come all the way back around, and we can support short stories again. So. I remember one of my friends is always lamenting that, because we were in high school, we were always just obsessing about Dragon Magazine, you know, like, mm -hmm. as soon as it came in, we had to, like, pour over every page. It's like, you know, I would trade all the game, all the video games and everything just to had this magazine again because that was the <laughs> something was lost but i don't want to be too too dire here you know i know you've done a lot of work with uh sort of helping to protect authors and right electronic when they're publishing things not to get screwed over and i was reading about that actually it's on it's on the wikipedia page but i remember just a little side story here uh my my professor uh was very tech orient techie you know really into the, whatever the latest thing is so he did the first ever uh composition you know every college has this mandatory college composition course right right uh, so he did the first uh electronic textbook for that oh and he published it and everything but it never never went anywhere and he was very upset about that and come to find out that the, uh, they had bought the rights to that not to publish it but to keep it from being published you know, sure. They saw this is too big of a threat to their to their models. I mean, that's probably been like twenty years ago. So <laughs> I sure went way beyond that. But yeah, you know, just an example of the the type of perils you might get into as an author, putting years of your life into something and then getting yeah. you know a bad end of a contract. So what, you probably have a lot to say about that. Well, I mean, you know, it is a it is a uh, it is a problem, and I think that that. There are, if you as an author want to get your work out there and get it published and get it seen, there are a lot of venues to do it. Um, however you are going to do this, when you look at contracts, uh, you you definitely want to be talking to a lawyer. You know, that's just a bullet you got to bite. Um, because there will be things that show up in contracts that shouldn't be there. Um and it may be that, especially with, there are a lot of what I would refer to as, as smaller regional presses, where the people may have the best intentions uh, to get your work out and, and to put it out there, but they probably haven't consulted a lawyer either. 
And, you know, one of the things that one of the things I've talked about um, with a lot of writers is if your contract has clauses that they don't have a way to exploit, don't sell them those rights. For example, if you're going to be published by a, 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 a small press and the small press is buying your audiobook rights, but they have no audiobook program. They don't have a contract with someone who's got an audiobook program. Mm. Don't sell them those rights. Um, when when my first books got sold to Bantam, my first uh, fantasy novel, uh, Once a Hero, got sold to Bantam, one of the clauses that my agent at the time struck was the clause about um, uh, game and game products. Because normally in a book contract, they'll they'll get a percentage of games and gaming projects. But as she pointed out to to the publishers, um, I had the contacts to be able to exploit that. Uh, and there's no reason that I should be giving them a piece of the action because they're not, you know, they're not going to be doing it. They can't. Uh, and they were willing to let it go. It, it wasn't a deal breaker. Um, you know, it was also funny that that ebooks up until 1998 ebooks were not a deal breaker in uh in contract you could keep for science fiction and fantasy you could hang on to your ebook rights uh after 1998 that suddenly became a deal breaker so they knew just starting then you know where this where the exploits were were going to be going to be coming um and that's why a lot of science fiction writers when the Kindle came out and when it became easier to self-publish, uh, were taking all of their uh, uh, their uh, back catalog because they owned all those ebook rights mm. and were uh, were putting them out. And I'm right with with Once a Hero, which you just showed. Uh, I I own the ebook rights, and so you know any errors in the book are mine. Uh, you know all my fault, but uh, uh, but you know getting those and being able to put them out. Very, very useful. And a lot of my my friends that are not just the ones doing ebooks, but just seem like every author, <laughs> not even authors, it seems like every creative person I talk to these days, maybe even some non creative, you know, writers, which I write nonfiction, but right. uh, there's this huge concern about the AI, you know, and what that's going to do. And are they going to get ripped off by it? And, you know, is it plagiarizing their content? And, you know, it seems like it's, I feel like we're kind of at the tip of the iceberg on that, or <laughs> you know, what what's that even means at this point? I do you have uh, some thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that I think um, a couple things. One, um, AI is a powerful tool to do research. Think of it less as artificial intelligence and more as a very sophisticated virtual assistant. Mm -hmm. um, you can tell your virtual assistant. Uh, go out and make me a one-page sketch of Vienna in 1888, uh, or what was you know find out what was playing in the in the uh, uh, Vienna Opera in 1888, uh, and then you know you can evaluate that. You can send it out for more, more missions and those things. But in terms of creativity, um, AI is not gonna AI is not going to present the full service um you know the, the five course meal of fiction um is it possible for ai to go out and and ate um some fairly basic fiction sure but it's not going to do character growth it's not going to do emotional content and one of the things that most people don't realize is that serendipity plays a uh, huge part in what gets written um for example if if uh, uh you know i'm going out to the grocery store in the morning before i come home to write a chapter and there is some jerk uh in the store and they annoy me uh that will affect what i'm doing when i write that day hmm. um you know ai literally by the nature of the way they're doing the large language models now does not remember what it has written down. So it, it basically can't do a second draft. 
uh, because it doesn't remember what it did before. Um, So there's an issue there. I think the other thing in in listening to and reading about AI, um, AI started out by going out and scraping articles that human beings had written and compiling them, averaging them out, and giving you the product. But now when it goes out to scrape the internet, it's scraping not only things that have been written by human beings, it's scraping things that have been written by AI. Uh, uh, so we're, we're getting to a point where basically it's, it's, con- it, it's cannibalizing its own output. And because what it does is it consumes a lot of output, then averages it, uh, you know, it, it, it's going to be moving. Now you're averaging averages. Uh, and you'll be averaging the averages of averages of averages, which pulls you away from the factual stuff. And I think anybody who's, who's again, played around with uh, AI, at least in the early uh, things, there were serious accuracy problems. And we also can't uh, discount the fact that there will be human beings that go out there and poison pill stuff, specifically so they'll know that AI has stolen it. I mean, the way that on uh, on maps, you will have towns that don't exist and roads that don't exist as a way for the, the map makers, for cartographers to guarantee nobody else is stealing their maps. Or the way that the Encyclopedia Britannica will have articles in it that are made up and have, n- there is no reality there, but they'll make up an article about something simply to gu- guard against someone else just you know photocopying their uh, their encyclopedia so you're going to have poison pill stuff sitting out there on the internet that people will find um and and i mean for anybody if anyone who wants to tell me oh no human beings would never do that it's like hello i mean <laughs> it's one thing to troll human beings but if we control the smartest machines on the on the planet you know that's even better uh, so it kind of reminds me about the, the old Xerox machines and copying a copy of a copy, and pretty soon you end up with something blurry. Yeah, that's, I never really thought about that, but yeah, it's sort of scraping. I yep. guess the initial rush would be great, but then when it starts to scrape itself, then it's going to diminish quickly. Well, and it, and it can't even identify that it's scraping itself because it doesn't remember what it put out there. Yeah, I mean, I just to me that like, well, Michael Stackpole has a new novel out. Well, that's exciting, right? You want to rush out and buy it. Well, there's sure. there's an AI produced novel. You know, I couldn't care less. <laughs> well, you know, again, you have to look at it. I mean, there's plenty of AI copy out there, and and you can you can read it or go out to YouTube, and there are plenty of YouTubes where they have an AI voice working off an AI script uh, with AI generated art. Um, and it. it to me, anyway, it's apparent because it's lifeless, it's repetitive, uh, it's non-emotional, non-logical, um, uh, and and so it, it it doesn't feel human. I mean, when we get to the point where um, we've got AIs that can, uh, you know, basically pass the Turing test and 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 develop that that full personality, um, that's a time when I suppose one can worry. I think the other thing which is which is kind of important is that people want to consume when when we go out to consume entertainment, it's sort of the same way that we make decisions about going out to dinner. Sometimes you just want a greasy hamburger. Other times, you know, you want to go to Ruth's Chris and and get the whole, you know, you want the good bottle of wine, you want the good steak, you want all of these things. And AIs may in fact get to a point where they're going to be able to to simulate the greasy uh, cheeseburger uh, fiction, uh, and there are there are plenty of people that do it. I mean, again, it's very easy to go onto Amazon and you can find in the science fiction area these series of stories that have sold tons and tons and tons. Um, I mean, there are some people that have got series that you know are numbering in the in the fifties, sixties, hundreds. Um, <laughs> And and when I look at those, and 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 I read those, there's nothing wrong with them. They've got action. They've got you know characters. They've got all of this stuff. They don't have the depth of characterization that I want in my stories. 
And so, but, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't very easily consume those. I mean, you know, last year I was studying some stuff and I went back and I, I, uh, downloaded just a ton of old pulp magazines uh and some of the stuff that i was reading from authors was brilliant and was giving me you know all the sort of stuff i like to see in my work and i was able to learn from them other stories in those magazines were certainly entertaining but they weren't giving me that full service uh they, again that i want but as entertaining when i was on a plane you know the time went by and 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 that was all i wanted um, it's also, apparently there's a study that indicates, uh, human beings, 50% of them, maybe as high as 75% of them don't have an internal dialogue. Don't have that little voice in the back of their head saying, are you sure you want to do this? And yet when we're reading fiction, I, I mean, my characters all the time are talking to themselves and, and, and that sort of thing. It may well be that these stories that don't deal with uh, a lot of emotional content are appealing simply because people who are coming home from work where they've had tons of drama don't want anything that requires them to think about emotions. Hmm. And so this for them is very much of an escape, you know, whereas for other people who are, who are living a life where, you know, they've been hiding from their emotions or it's an, an emotionally unsatisfying uh, situation they're in. They escape into this fiction where they can live out some other character's emotions. So, again, you know, it's like going to a restaurant. We choose what we want in the moment. It's not to say one is necessarily better than the other. Um, I just know that for me, writing the writing the stuff without emotionally engaging characters, I just find boring. Um, so that's, that's why I'm not grinding that out. If I could, oh my God, I'd be having lots of, I'd be having money. And right now, you know, we'd be doing this and the background would be the Seychelles islands. And, uh, you know, um, I would be, uh, uh, you know, a lot more tan. Well, no, I probably would because I still hide from the sun, but, um, that's a cool background. Well, I know exactly what you mean. You know, I don't always want to sit down and read something like game of thrones, yeah, yeah. You don't have to keep track. I mean, I love it. It was great, but it's that's a lot of you know work almost trying to keep track of who's doing what, and you know it's dark. <laughs> that's why I like to switch, swap it up, and like I'm just going to read some Conan comics today. <laughs> there you go. Yep. <laughs> yep. Well, let's uh, see if we can uh, sort of step in the what do they say? Step in the way back machine. <laughs> okay. I want to get into your early days because you were doing some really. Uh, fascinating stuff with uh, tunnels and trolls and then uh, mercenaries and is it mercenary mm -hmm. spies and private eyes and this sort of leads to wasteland and there's a lot of fun right. stuff to talk about there you know my, my audience is really computer role-playing games and early computer games you know is there what they love sure. to hear about so but i think everybody would like to hear more about the tunnels and trolls and <laughs> how your mercenaries game and, and all the innovations with that so Oh, sure. Yeah, I know this um, is back a ways, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's Well, you know how it is when you get ancient. You remember the early times easier than you do the, the most recent times. Well, sure. Um, couldn't tell you what I had for lunch, but um, <laughs> uh, back when I was in college at the University of Vermont, uh, I was... Uh, uh, I guess I really got interested in games in 72 when uh, Boris Baski and Bobby Fischer were playing chess for the World Championship. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, you know, heightened my awareness. And from chess, I got into war games. And then uh, uh, I, I had a subscription to Strategy and Tactics magazine because you got a game every month um, or every two months. I guess it was six times a year. Uh, and in that, uh, they would send out uh, flyers from other game companies, the uh, uh, SPI, the the company was great about promoting the industry that way. And uh, in there, there was a flyer for Tunnels and Trolls. Um, as well, there was flyers for metagaming stuff. And metagaming would sell you Dungeons and Dragons or those things. So, you know, in 74, when D&D &D first came out, you know, I, I was looking at uh, trying to find out what these things were. Cause this, was, this was curious. What is a role-playing game? I mean, they literally, there was no such thing. 
I mean, I was born into a world where role playing did not exist. And um, so Tunnels and Trolls is the second ever role playing game. And Rick Loomis, who ran Flying Buffalo Incorporated, um, did solo adventures. He did the very first one, Buffalo Castle. Um, I bought it, played it a bunch, and Ken had done one. And I, I uh, played that a bunch. And then I decided to do one myself. Um, and I, I actually ended up doing two, which were very reminiscent of um, Buffalo Castle, which were really, uh, really rudimentary uh, in that they were really going back to the to the original sort of play where it was all based around a dungeon. And in Buffalo Castle, your choices largely were directional. So you'd be mapping as you went and, and things like that to find out where you were going to go. And then when you reached an, an area or an encounter, you would play through that using uh, some really fast and fun mechanics. Uh, those are the Tunnels and Trolls mechanics. Um, with City of Terrors, which was the first big one that I did, um, I walked away from doing uh, uh, geographical uh, choices and went more into storytelling choices. So uh, that was a lot more fun asking you to make choices and having you uh, not worry about mapping, uh, but just rolling through the uh, uh, rolling through the uh, uh, adventure, making moral choices. Uh, do you choose to help somebody? Do you choose to run away? Do you choose to do something else? Um, and I really loved writing those branching stories. Mm -hmm. um, that was a lot of fun in flying buffalo uh that was pretty much our stock and trade for tunnels and trolls was doing the solo adventures uh because we had at least 25 of them maybe more um and i edited probably the first two-thirds of the line or middle middle third of the line i should say because there were a bunch before me um but uh but that was fun and then uh, you know, Tunnels and Trolls was created by Ken San Andre, and then uh, I was working for Flying Buffalo as was Liz Danforth and and uh, Steve Crompton and uh, Pat Mueller. We were the production department there. Um, I did Mercenary Spies and Private Eyes, so we started adding gunpowder and skills to the Tunnels and Trolls system. So those two games were uh, backward and forward compatible. Um, which was real important because uh, getting support material out for mercenary spies and private eyes, Flying Buffalo only had so much capacity. But if you could use guns in the old um, Tunnels and Trolls solo adventures, then you know we had we had more more places to sell those. Um, and uh, yep, yeah, that was the that was the original cover. Um, and uh, uh, so that was fun. And then the guys from uh, uh, Brian Fargo uh, from Interplay was looking at doing uh, a future after the Holocaust style game, uh, which became Wasteland. Uh, Ken gave us that name. Uh, but Brian came over from Southern California, talked to Ken, talked to me. Um, and uh, we used the Mercenary Spies and Private Eyes system to be the to be the underpinning of, of uh, Wasteland. Um, and then we got Liz Danforth to do maps and uh, John Carver to do maps and, uh, well, Ken, and, uh, and then I did a whole bunch. Um, and that was, uh, I was just talking to Brian uh, not too long ago. Uh, and I guess it took us four years to get that game done uh, mm -hmm. from conception to final delivery. Um, but it was, um, it, it it was a labor of love and and uh, and just a lot of fun and and what was cool is that people still seem to uh, seem to love it. Um, oh, which is, I mean, to me, is amazing because that's a long time ago. So well, now we got Wasteland two and three and yep, and good well, and, and, Fallout and all that. And... Yep, yeah, exactly. You know the the same. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, recognize this photo back behind me here, but oh yeah, 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 you're yeah. in there. Yep. Yeah. Right there. Second from the second from the left. Ken is Ken is right in front of me and I'm right behind. And then uh, uh, Alan Pavlich, who was the uh, lead uh, programmer, uh, I mean, was the programmer, uh, is there on one knee. Uh, 
yeah, Alan and I worked real, real closely to uh, to get all of that uh, to make it all work. It was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I could see it's a lot of fun. That looks like a fun photo. It must have been a fun day at the photo. I, we, so we were on the middle of nowhere in, in a in a desert in uh, in California. Uh, photographer taking those shots, and as we came back into town, like I say, we all look like I mean, it's looking like a badass, relatively speaking, uh, biker gang. And remember, we we stopped at a Denny's. Out of Mad Max. Starving. What's that? <laughs> it's like a straight out of Mad Max, you know. It was, yeah, I mean, it was. We were really, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very much. Without a doubt, that that influence there. But we um, we stopped at a Denny's, and all of us went into the bathroom to wash all the dirt and everything off. Mm -hmm. And and while we're in there, we're talking about the game and talking about uh, computers and RAM and how many discs is going to be on. So it was just pure computer nerd chatter, right? And uh, and as we're talking, suddenly in the only stall in the bathroom. There's a flushing sound and a little old man came walking out and he had been listening to us clearly because the look on his face, he was initially, he had a totally benign look on his face. And then when he saw us, he just grew pale and got the hell out of there <laughs> as fast as he could. He was not sure what we were. And actually we ended up having to go to a second restaurant because they wouldn't serve us there. What? Um, so, so you imagine we were, we were, we were too nasty looking to be served in a Denny's. Oh, um, so, ah, that's that's a whole different level there. <laughs> that you know, yeah, yeah. Well, we you know we owned it, so. <laughs> so it sounded like you had been in the computers before then, right? And you, it's kind of fit right into the computer development part of it. Or yeah, was, well, you know, I had done a curve, I, or I mean, what? Well, I had done a. Uh, I'd spent four months at Coleco in their advanced research and development department, uh, looking at doing computer games and, and uh, things on that order. And so that was really my first uh, brush with uh, programmers and, and, and how to speak to programmers. Uh, you know, cause you can tell a programmer, Hey, uh, you know, for this game, I need something where I can have a, you know, one in 10 chance. And the programmer would look at you and say, can't do one in 10. And you know, as a, as a as a normal individual, you'd be sitting there going, "The hell are you talking about?" And I said, and, and so you light bulb went on the back of my head, and I said, "What can you do?" He says, "I can do one in two, one in four, one in eight, you know, one in sixteen, you know, take your pick." Uh, and it was like, "Oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, one in eight is fine. You know, uh, I'll just adjust my thinking." And so you know, you learn then to to talk with programmers and. And, you know, whenever they tell you no, it's like, okay, what can we do? And, and uh, I mean, Alan was great. Alan, Alan and I had these wonderful call, uh, conversations about how to put uh, everything together. Um, it was, it was, you know, unbelievably, uh, unbelievably cool. And um, I remember Ken would call me up and say, Alan won't let me do something. And I would call Al. Ken would explain it to me. I'd call Alan. We'd figure out what we would do. We also figured out about three more things we could do uh, while we were uh, while we were discussing this stuff. And then uh, I, I would call the rest of the team and say, "Okay, guys, you know this is this is what we can do now. Here are the uh, here are the different things that'll uh, that'll go together." Um, and that was just a lot of fun. And that's why um, Wasteland, for example. As I recall, uh, when we started out, there were three ways to open a door. And by the end of the development process, there were 14 ways to open a door. Uh, so pretty much anything you could think to do, you know, any weapon you could use on it, any tool you could use on it, anything like that, that would get you through a door. Um, and so it was, it was, uh, uh, and we could also trigger cause and effect, which at that time, there was no cause and effect. There was only cause. So, yeah. so, <laughs> so no cause and effect what no i mean we had we so uh the only things that would happen in games at that time is you know you would step on a tile or you would do something and then there would be one singular response to it oh i see whereas uh with the coding we were doing um not only would 
would whatever you're doing affect that individual tile, but you could get it to you could call other tiles that it would affect. So you might kill the guy on you know on a one, but that means that three more people would show up. You know, on on uh, A26, B26, C26, who are obviously coming in response. And you would be able to have the statement in the distance you hear footsteps. So as they're advancing on the map, they would finally get to the point where, you know, they can see these guys and engage them. Uh, but literally, uh, until that time, that just didn't happen in games. Um which was it made, it, made it a lot of fun for us. And and I think, you know, we would have figured out it, you couldn't do that, but none of us knew what we were doing, really. Uh, so it was like, sure, we can make that work. You know, you just have to, you know, you have to make sure you're calling your shots and we'll let the test to make sure it works. This sounds like, I would love it to have been a fly in the, the wall or maybe that guy in the bathroom. I don't want <laughs> to be privy to all this <laughs> as it unfolded. I mean, <laughs> must have been... I mean, I can't. By the time you got to the finished product, it must have been really exciting to see how. What are people going to make of this? Oh yeah, without a doubt. And I mean, we knew. So the game was on, I think, five discs. So you had to you had to duplicate, you know, five discs to be able to to play the game. And there was one map that we knew players would be crossing back and forth. Uh, several times. And this transit map, we put the Guardians of the Old Order on it. Uh, and if you got near the Guardians of the Old Order, they would yell at you, they would insult you, uh, and if you decided to attack them, they would kill you. And we knew, uh, I knew, uh, I designed that stuff, but I knew the way gamers think, the way people think, Every single time they went on that map, they would test to see if they would gotten strong enough to take out the Guardians of the Old Order. Mm. Just because that's, you know, they're being insulted and, and ridiculed and everything. You know, it's going to get into your mind. So by the time toward the end of the game where they get strong enough, where they've got the, you know, they've got the most powerful weapons and stuff like that, not only are they sure they're going to be able to take these guys, they are going to go through gleefully and take these guys. They're going to be thinking, I am totally badass. Uh, and, and, you know, and you still see that. You still see that today in games. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I play World of Warcraft and in their Pandaria remix, uh, there are cared people who have gotten their, their tunes incredibly powerful. Uh, so that if you just want to advance a little bit, you know, advance a character a little bit, you just run around with them. Uh, they don't care. They're killing everything because they're enjoying having all that power, you know, and there's a, there's a knot of players who just follow like little ducklings drafting behind them, never going to die, you know, but accomplishing what we need to accomplish. And uh, I mean, it's just, you know, part of humanity. And, and there it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, you know, World of Warcraft. I remember the the Fell Reaver and that Burning Crusade, and yep. first time you're just so excited. Oh, I got a new expansion, and then it gets smushed by that guy three or four times. And when you finally come back later and you kick his ass, it's just yep. so... yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And and you know that's the thing. I mean, that's that's having that emotional journey, you know, of 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 of. You know, you're getting smushed by the guy. You feel sad. You feel angry. You feel embarrassed. You couldn't beat him. And then in the interim, you're going to try it again. And you'll come that close. And you'll be a little bit angrier and everything. And then finally, you're going to come back. That same sort of uh, emotional journey of, of going from feeling bad to feeling victorious, especially when it's spread out over, well, for some players, hours you know, for the rest of us, probably weeks. Um, you know, the, the fact is, is, it's a legitimate emotional experience. And you and you get the same thing in books and stories. You know, that, that if you're locked into those characters, if the reader has been good enough to communicate uh, something about uh, the main characters that allow you to get into their head, to sympathize or empathize with them, um, 
you get to have that same emotional journey. Uh, and this this is what makes fiction so incredibly powerful. Um, and and I mean, I just think it's great. Obviously, it, it does well for entertainment, uh, but it's I think it's also you know fairly healthy for people uh, to 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 have something yeah. <laughs> going on emotionally in their lives. Yeah, absolutely. I was you know after reading a uh, Rogue Squadron, it got me interested to rewatch the prequels and the, you know, the Star mm-hmm. Wars movies. You notice that theme again and again. Like you're not ready. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yep. one. You're not ready. Oh, I'm ready. Okay, you get your butt kicked. Yep. <laughs> but, but you know what? I think maybe there's people that are just starting off trying to be creative, and that they think maybe it'd be better just to have them win right away. And like, if you do it that way, there's not you're not going to have that tension and it's just you know you I don't know what you call that I've heard it called different things but making the character too powerful at the beginning sure sure you don't have enough of a progression well, you know, I always come back to role playing games and like when you start off you're you might get killed by a rat <laughs> right right <laughs> and that's not a glitch that doesn't mean it's a bad game I mean that's part of the fun is eventually you'll sure. be able to kill that rat no problem well one of the things that that it's difficult for a lot of people to to get a grasp on um, is that uh, when when you start out wanting to write, uh, you're not sure what you're doing. We may have really good uh, role models, but one of the uh, and and really good characters that we've seen, and uh, you know, we may have learned from other writers how to tell the stories, or we're learning from other writers how to tell the stories but one of the things is is that is that we latch on to these characters who are heroic and if you read a novel or a series of novels you know after book three or after book five you you have followed this character's journey to get them there um that's the character you remember and when you start to write that's the character you want to write Mm. but in reality we all know that that's the character whose story is done you need to come all the way back to the beginning the story is how they got there not that they're there and so this is it's 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 a it's a subtle point but it's a really really important point Uh, a lot of people will be writing hero stories a lot of people who are gamers will write about their character who is now you know level 19 uh and again it's not a very interesting story because they can do everything and the mm-hmm. rats are no longer a threat. Uh, whereas the fun story, the intriguing story, the one we can identify with is when, in fact, uh, you know, the rats are just, uh, the rats are still a threat and you're still level one. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, with World of Warcraft, but whenever I get together with my friends, we're always talking about, we sound like a bunch of uh, sort of stereotype old complainers, <laughs> from grumpy old men, you know, for lack of a better way to put it. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I remember back when, you know, it, it it was almost impossible to get a mount. You know, you had to yep. to buy that mount. You had to have so much gold, and it was just such a huge deal. And you got your first one, and you know now they give it away. You know. Yep. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah. I don't know. Though. Is that? I'm not, I don't. I mean, obviously they know what they're doing. They continue to make you know money, but yeah, I don't know. I kind of want to have to earn it. <laughs> well, there were, but there are different things that you end up earning. You know mm-hmm. now. Uh, they, I, I personally think they've done something really, really well. The fact that that there is scarcity with some mounts and things like that mm. means that you actually have to work to to get them, and I think that's cool. Um, the way they've reworked weapons and armor again, you've got to work to to increase that. Um, the big thing I think about for those games and for science fiction and fantasy is discovery the fact that we're out there learning about new stuff both learning about how it works but also just being able to have that gosh wow you know this is a new world and and what's going on here um i think is a is a well i i I know is a huge part of what people read for i think it was um uh, it's not john steinbeck it's one of the modern literary writer um who has made the comment that the reason that science fiction and fantasy will never be capital l literature 
is that in writing them, you have to do a lot of world creation, which is not anything that happens in capital L literature. And uh, it's estimated that, I think it's John Updike actually is, is the person I'm quoting, but it's estimated that 25% of the words in a science fiction or fantasy novel is world building. Hmm. And, and this is just something that, that, that literators, literary critics are just not prepared to, to use. It makes uh, science fiction and fantasy very idiosyncratic to themselves and therefore tends to diminish the validity of the um, aspect of human nature that's being dealt with in these stories. Hmm. Uh, so I think that that for the people who would look at it and say, does this reveal anything about the human condition? Um, they say it fails on on two parts. One, how you're dealing with the human condition is obscured by the building of the world. Uh, and um, I mean, my response to that particular criticism would be, but we're building a world that human beings have created. So the, the very act of world creation is showing us something about something about human nature. And the second thing that they would say is that people are reacting to stimulus, which is not real. Uh, it's 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 imagined, but too far imagined away from what we would write about if you were writing about, um, you know, walking down the street and seeing a car accident and dragging someone from the from a burning car and saving their lives mm. um and and how that would change your life now i don't see that any different from you know uh, uh somebody going along in his spaceship getting a mayday call seeing a ship that's been hit by a micrometeorite and having to go in and save people and seeing their gratitude and seeing their pain at other people having died both can be reflective of the of the human condition but for the people who are who are calling balls and strikes for what is going to be literature, uh, for them it's it's you know it's all balls, it's not strikes. Oh, uh, those people don't know anything. I mean, I'm thinking about all the great world creators. I mean, Tolkien and oh, yeah, Lucas, yeah. and I mean, uh, trying to think. Of, well, even Gibson. <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, there's nothing. Uh, who who would read those and say this had, this had nothing to say to me? <laughs> I mean, come give me a break, you know. <laughs> well, I think it's it's um, the other thing. I know one of the other criticisms which is leveled at fantasy and science fiction is that um, because fantasy and science fiction are uh, literatures of allegory. Hmm. Uh, it's difficult. They become difficult to read because you don't know what is true and what isn't. You know, if we were to say, if you were to have the sentence in uh, a uh, fantasy story, uh, you know, the dragon ate the moon. Uh, is it literally a dragon eating the moon, hmm. or is it a, is it an allusion to an eclipse? Uh, and because it could be either way for again the the umpires of literature um that that's a ball uh it can it, it can only be an allegory but we can have it also be literal uh and and they're just not prepared to deal with that and and i i certainly understand what they're i understand what they're saying um i i think that I think that they're limiting themselves. I think that that they they can't have gotten to where they are and be so stupid they can't differentiate between those things. I think they're just seeing a more pure art form and they don't it, want to have to differentiate. It just seems a bit snooty or snobby or you know, I've heard I don't want to throw any of my colleagues under the a bus. You know? <laughs> I mean, I've heard them say things like, Well, you will not write any stories in my class that involve an elf, a vampire or right. staged up you know because that's genre fiction i mean the way they say it is just like that is beneath my contempt sure, sure, sure. <laughs> i'm thinking <laughs> well i freaking love this stuff you know i don't I don't quite get what happened 
<laughs> well, but um, you know, we why get anybody that, would think that way. Well, I mean, we get that within our own within our own community. However, I mean, I read a lot of tie-in fiction, uh, and and you know, the tie-in fiction is seen as being a step below. Um, and and I've had ample experience, uh, and and I can tell you, I work just as hard doing tie-in fiction as I do do in my own stuff. Um, you know, one of the things I say, I've said in classes, um, you know, the difference is when you're doing tie-in fiction, um, you're going through and you're going to have to deal with something stupid someone else did. So you're going to figure out your way around it. Whereas when I'm doing my own stuff, I have to go in and I have to do something about something stupid someone else did, but I'm someone else. You know, I'm the one that created that problem. So it's it, it's all the same work, you know. It's just it 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 is just applied at different times. Um, but uh, you know, how many times have have uh, you know do we hear people talk about uh, you know the Twilight books are not real science fiction? They're not real fantasy. They're they're something else. Um, uh, it's it's uh, or you know uh, an urban fantasy. Well. Real good example, um, when Steve Donaldson's fifth book in the uh, Thomas Covenant uh, books came out, there was an argument uh, between him and his editor because uh, half of that book is shot from another character's point of view, not Thomas Covenant's point of view. And uh, they wanted him to uh, rewrite it. So the first half of that book is back through Thomas Covenant's point of view, and he didn't want to. And the editor's argument was, you can't do what you've done because that's not done in science fiction. The 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 stuff got appealed up to the publisher, and the publisher said, that's fine. This book isn't science fiction. It's a bestseller. Uh, and in bestsellers, we can do that. Uh -huh. So uh and and that is and i mean that's something i keep in the back of my mind uh uh you know when i'm writing it's like yeah you may not be able to do this in science fiction however uh yes we can uh and 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 that's that's one of the other things which is no matter what anybody tells you you can or cannot do in a genre uh especially if you do it well you can do anything if you do it poorly, doesn't matter if everybody else does it. They'll tell you, no, you can't do it. Do it well, and they will be happy. Uh, so, yeah, I'm thinking about uh, Harlan Ellison and his dangerous visions. And it's really, you know, I've read some great science fiction. We, we should probably talk about William Gibson at some point. <laughs> but sure, sure, there's sure. so much. To, I got so many ideas bouncing around in my head talking to you. I was just thinking then that uh, a lot of the, uh, well, we could put Poe, Conan, mm -hmm. Lovecraft, and the, the, where did that come from? It was these pulp, uh, pulp fiction, uh, basically no serious liter literati. <laughs> you know, they would have scoffed at that stuff. You know, and now this a lot of that stuff is considered classic. Yeah, I think I think that stuff gets it gets dismissed too easily. Or detective stories, film noir, you know, and all yep. the yeah. Sam Spade and all that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, and it's and it's really funny because you will get, uh, uh, you know, Dashiell Hammett wouldn't have been seen as being literary mm -hmm. in his lifetime, but you know, now after he's dead, uh, suddenly there's a reconsideration of, of seeing that stuff, and it, it's funny. Um, as I said, a year and a half ago, I was doing a lot of reading of pulp magazines and I was reading a lot of Westerns. And uh, mm -hmm. I was reading uh, and, and also reading Robert Howard. And, and Howard, toward the end of his life, was writing uh, some Western stories about a character named Breckenridge Elkins, uh, who was a character from, from Texas, very much sort of the same sort of uh, area where... Uh, Howard was from, and I had seen somewhere that uh, a few people had thought that had Howard lived, 
he would have become very much of a uh, Western regional writer and be be well known for it. Hmm. The other stories that I was reading, uh, these Westerns, there's especially two sets. Uh, Clarence Mulford is the guy who created Hopalong Cassidy. Okay. Uh, and and most of us only know Hopalong Cassidy from uh, from the TV show, which was an abomination. Everything, that Hopalong Cassidy is nothing like the Hopalong Cassidy in the books. Uh, and Mulford's, um, Mulford's style and what Mulford wrote uh, very heavily influenced uh, the way that Louis L'Amour writes. And Louis L'Amour, I mean, just, and, and Mulford was incredibly popular. Another writer who was writing at the same time was W.C. Tuttle. And he created a character um, named Hashknife Hash Hartley, who was a detective running around with a partner, running around doing uh, solving mysteries and stuff like that. And uh, Tuttle stuff was addressing issues that were way ahead of their time. I mean, mm -hmm. you could read, if, if you handed a number of people some of the Tuttle books right now, uh, they would decry them as being woke uh, just yeah. because of some of the issues that he was dealing with and the stuff that was being said. And yet this guy's writing in the 20s and 30s. Um, W.C. Uh, right Tuttle? What's that? W.C. Tuttle? Yeah, W.C. Tuttle. Huh. Um, but I am I am 100% convinced. The interesting thing is, so Mulford and Tuttle knew each other. Uh, they both were hanging out in New York. Um, uh, they knew each other, and they would uh, go uh, uh, visit um, uh, the... Uh, and, and a lot of these things you can get uh, uh, before you actually go ahead and buy them from Amazon, go out to uh, archive.org and you can get them for free, download them. Uh, cause uh, many, many of them have been, have been scanned in and they're in their, uh, like I say, wonderful books and archive.org has got uh, a lot of PDFs of old pulp magazines. Uh, and that's where I was, uh, dragging them, uh, dragging them out of, but I'm convinced had Robert Howard, uh, gotten to New York just once and had he run into Tuttle and Mulford he would have run into Tuttle first I'm convinced he and Tuttle would have gotten along mm -hmm. and uh, I'm convinced that uh, uh, just by making the contact with them uh, Howard would have been able to move up because because writing for weird tales was kind of at a, at a very low level in the pulps uh, whereas these guys were writing for short story magazine and blue book there were a couple levels in between and howard i've seen red letters by howard where he was lamenting the fact he could not crack that upper level but his writing howard's especially the breckenridge elkin story were good enough that i think he would have i think he would have made it in short story if he were writing westerns and and had been submitting them there if he had had friends like tuttle and mulford just saying yeah you know you got to take a look at this guy. Uh, I, I think he would have had the career that I'm, I'm hoping in, 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 in one of the parallel universes we have, you know, <laughs> that is exactly what happened. Uh, and so, and, and while I would, I would hate for that universe to have, you know, the, the Conan and the fantasy and the weird fiction that he was writing be, be uh, sort of shunted aside and remembered as, the other stuff he did in the beginning of his career, I would have loved for him to put in another another 40 years writing stuff, uh, you know, because then we'd be knowing, you know, we'd be knowing Robert Howard, not as the creator of Conan, but, you know, as this guy who was, uh, you know, rivaling Louis L'Amour. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that would have been, that would have been fascinating. Yeah. Of course, you did a, a Conan novel of your own, right? The, I did. I did the novelization of the of the Jason Momoa movie. I don't know if you wanted to talk about that. Sure. Yeah, that was that was a lot of fun to do. Um, the uh, I like uh, the movie too. I know some people didn't seem to think the movie. I mean, you got the Schwarzenegger ones, <laughs> right? It, uh, it, I, it I like a lot, of, a lot of complications that went on. The nice thing for me for being able to do the um, the novelization of the movie. This is it, right? That, I went over to California to see a rough cut of the film. 
and uh, the producer, uh, one of the producers was there. I was with another writer. Um, we got to see the film and the producer talked to us about it. And they actually included, there's a voiceover at the end of the movie, um, which was something that, that uh, the other writer and I suggested they put in uh, just to tie it up. But what was great is that the, the studio did not have the rights of approval on the novel. Uh, that was with Conan Incorporated. And so as we were walking back to the Conan Incorporated offices, I just turned to my contact and I said, uh, I said, look, Jay, uh, instead of writing the novelization of the script, why don't I write the book that the script was taken from? So that allowed me to go back through, rearrange the front end, include some interstitial material, put an actual end on the movie, uh, bring characters back in who were forgotten halfway through and also get rid of a character I hated in the movie. Not get rid of, but give them a personality change um, and do some more background on the, on the other, on the other forces. Um, so it was, for me, I, I loved it. What I, what I sort of conceived it as was if Howard were writing Conan in, in, in the new century, uh, this is, this is what his Conan would have been. Uh, it was close as I could get it anyway. So. I got it. I, I just purchased it. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to reading that because I've, you know, I've read just about everything Conan that I can get my hands on. And you know, Robert Jordan, you know, his Conan mm -hmm. stories, and uh, who's some of the other ones? There's a lot of other ones. The, the I just think it's, I picked up a collection of Robert E. Howard uh, doing stories set in H.P. Lovecraft's universe. And those are sure. Fun. sure. Yeah, all those guys back then used to uh, correspond back and forth. Um, Fletcher Pratt and H.P. Lovecraft and um, uh, Howard, of course, uh, Clark Ashton Smith, um, Argus Durlis, I guess, a little bit. Um, one other guy whose name is dropping out of my brain, but uh, there was a lot of correspondence going back and forth there, and, and they all... Oh, Sprague you know, the Camp. Is that, what's that? Oh, well, Sprague yeah. the Camp. Sprague, yeah, Sprague came in a little bit. He, he was a little bit. He was a little bit later. Um, I, I knew him a little bit. Uh, I used to see him at conventions and uh, for Sorcerer's Apprentice magazine from Flying Buffalo. We uh, we got an article from him, um, oh. and and he was uh, he was really instrumental in helping Conan stay around and grow. Um, there are a lot of critics of the way that Sprague used to uh, edit the Conan books and especially um, the way that he and, and Lynn Carter and a couple other guys would take uh, non-Conan stories and then turn them into Conan stories. Um, so there's a lot of diehard fans of Robert Howard who don't like what Sprague did. Um, I think that, I think what they don't know, and, and I only know from having had a conversation with him, is the number of things that he caught that writers were going to put into Conan's stories that he said, no, you know, that's not going to work, uh, is great. Because the, the output, uh, you know, during the Jordan years and, and all the people who were writing around then, or many of them, um, just wouldn't have been as good as they were if not for Sprague Camp. Um, that doesn't mean, and I, I, I tend to agree, I think Sprague should not have done the the, the hacking together of, of stories uh, the way they were done. I, I, I don't like that, but uh, but that's, you know. Uh, Call of the Conquerors. But it did, it did keep, keep Conan alive, so. Just the Cole stories? Which Cole. is that? Was he taking the Cole the Conqueror stories and it wasn't Cole the Conqueror stories? Um, Howard, uh, there was a magazine called Adventure, if I recall, that um, uh, Howard desperately wanted to break into. And Howard was doing uh, Adventure used to do a lot of historical stories or historical sounding stories. Uh, mm -hmm. Frank Yerby uh, used to write these wonderful um, uh, uh, spectacles, uh, historical uh short historical novels um and and howard desperately wanted to break into that market and so he was doing stories 
that were set in the Middle East or set in Afghanistan or set in these uh, different spots. And he was trying to make them very historical. Um, and these are stories that ended up uh, being rewritten into uh, Conan stories. Um, and that just wasn't. And, and the other thing, and I've said this to, at various points, the there are different ways that you can look at Conan. And El Sprague de Camp, who was a college professor, hmm. uh, always well-dressed, always well-spoken, always very kind to me, um, he viewed Conan as the, the noble savage. I, and, and others, have seen Conan as in a, in a different light. To me, Conan is always the wolf at the edge of the firelight. You don't know if it's there to eat you or if it's there to stave off with you whatever else is out in the darkness. Hmm. I mean, I think uh, Rogues in the House, in terms of Conan stories, has got the five emotional states of Conan. Fiercely loyal, utterly savage, uh, uh, can be remorseless, can be noble, can be honorable. Oh, and it's got a sense of humor. That's the fifth one, sense of humor. Mm -hmm. You know, noble and honorable, I, I see it as being in the same, in the same area. Um, and you see all of those states of Conan's being in uh, that, uh, in Rogues in the House. Um, and so, you know, it, it, whenever writing Conan fiction, whenever I've had to uh, do something like that, it's always been with, with Rogues in the House as kind of defining my playing field. Uh, you know, as long as the story is going to fit in there, you know, we're good to go. Now, that's a brilliant way. <laughs> I love the way he framed it. Wolf at the edge of the fire like this. Yep. That's spot on. Yeah. Let's see. I don't know what you do. We kind of hit an almost an hour and a half already. You do good for a couple more things here? because <laughs> Sure. Yeah. 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 I think they got to kill us if we don't say more about Battletech and we haven't well, really. That's problem. I got a lot of people who are interested in Neuromancer. Mm -hmm. um, Neuromancer, uh, I had done a couple of games for Interplay. And uh, Neuromancer, they uh, they brought me in to work on. Uh, and uh, Bruce Balfour, a uh, friend of mine. Uh, and we were both uh, doing stuff. Um, the, the main problem that we had with Neuromancer uh, is... Uh, Love Gibson's writing. It's brilliant. Um, the big problem with uh, the novel Neuromancer is there is no plot. Hmm. There are a lot of things that happen. There is no plot. And so when you're when you're trying to take a novel uh, or the world of a novel and and turn it into a computer game, you have got to find a plot. So that's what we did. We just sort of inserted a plot in there uh, to to have a have an arrow to drive the game forward, and then we were just you know uh, trying to simulate the world of Neuromancer as as best we could. Um, so it was it was a uh, and that was it was really funny actually because we had to for some reason and I don't know why uh, Dr. Timothy Leary had the rights to something having to do with neuromancer so no, this doesn't surprise me i don't know why it just doesn't this is yeah it, so literally before we could work on the game we we put together the, the the plan of what we wanted to do and then four of us went to timothy leary's house to oh basically God. sit there tell him what we were going to do and and get his blessing uh so we could go off and do it it was one of the one of the weirder and stranger things I've ever done in my career. And one of the few things my mother could understand, you know, and I, cause I was talking to her on the phone going, you know, yeah, yeah. We went to Timothy Leary's house, the Dr. Timothy Leary. Yeah. She wasn't quite sure what to make of it all, but at least she, you know, she knew the name. Well, it does beg a question. <laughs> you just talked or was there. No, no, we just talked. Oh. That was yeah. It was it was all business. <laughs> uh, it was there was no no recreation. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah I remember reading that novel, and I just can't imagine trying to make a game out of it. I, mean, <laughs> I don't even... Wow. You know, the setting, the world is fascinating. Yeah. And so that's what we're looking at, is, is pretty much taking the setting, taking the world, uh, figuring out a way to make it work, and then just doing things that were... Uh, because humor at that time, humor was also a big part of games. I mean, there had to be some of that. Uh, there's some of that in it. And so putting humor into uh, uh, into the game was uh, was also just a lot of fun. Uh, and simulating, you know, old bulletin board systems and, and all the, you know, all the tech, which is now so, so retro, nobody even recognizes it. Uh, so. Let's talk a little bit about Battletech. Sure. Yeah, I had Jordan on not too long ago. Mm -hmm. I remember one of the things that he said, and I'll never forget it, <laughs> was that uh, somebody had told him, might have been you, I'm not sure about that, but somebody had told him, look, in real life, these giant robots would just sink into the ground. <laughs> they wouldn't be able to move because of physics, you know, and, and gravity. Right. Wait, and I, <laughs> I was like, oh, I didn't want to hear that. Because, I mean, who hasn't dreamed about piloting one of these things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't well, know. <laughs> Do you agree with that? <laughs> that? That was that was that was not me who said that. Oh, uh, good. You know, I think from from Sam Lewis, who who worked at FASA for a number of years, running FASA. Um, you know, BattleTech is uh, science fiction with World War II technology, uh, and mm -hmm. and even with all the advances we've done with the clans and everything like that, it's it's slightly above. Russo-Ukrainian war technology. Um, you know, we, we don't have the drones, but we also don't have, you know, beam weapons and and uh, and that sort of stuff. But otherwise, you know, those mechs are just MLRS launchers and auto cannons. Uh, so, uh, uh, but it's 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 a fun and dynamic world. It's an interesting look at a science fiction universe where there are no aliens. It's just human beings. Uh, so you know, the monsters out there are us. Uh, and that always makes for interesting stories. Um, the universe is vast, so you can tell whatever story you want to. But the core of the stories and the core that the universe is built around is the battle mech. You know, the same way that, that feudal, feudal worlds were all about uh, a knights and samurai. Um, you know, so it is that this neo-feudal world or feudal universe uh, is all about battle mechs. Because uh, they they sort of occupy that same niche in the in the power structure and in honor and uh, uh, in and in that sort of stuff. It's um, you know it's a universe that uh, I really like and I'm real happy that I've been able to inject a lot of politics into it and a lot of a lot of cool ideas. Um, you know, having worked with the team for well now getting on the past thirty six years. Uh, of, of having been um, uh, part of what's been going on and helping plan it and then helping to both uh, write the stories and and now, uh, which is very weird, you know, now I'm in that point in my career where I'm helping bring in new writers, uh, you know, to the, be the people that can take over for me when I finally, you know, fake my death and, and move to the Seychelles. Um, so, uh, yeah. which is, and, and it's, and it's, for me, it's a lot of fun watching watching people come up, uh, and uh, or some of the younger writers going, "Hey, you know, we could do a crossover story here," or, "Hey, I invented this. Can you use it?" Uh, or, "I'm going to use something you did. Is that okay?" It's just a lot of fun watching the universe and and the way it the interconnections still remain there. I was talking to uh, AI earlier <laughs> really about and I was saying, "What is the uh, what is Michael uh, done for the?" BattleTech series and it says, oh, he expanded the, uh, he expanded it, he fleshed it out, you know, he took it from <laughs> like bare bones. I mean, it was very complimentary. <laughs> you know, it uh, made it sound like you're pretty much the BattleTech man. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Well, is it well, that is that going too far? I mean, you obviously you've exerted a huge influence on it. I, I, I think I think certainly viewing it from the outside, that. That certainly can be, it, it could be seen that way. Yeah. I think that my impression and my feeling has always been that there has been uh, uh, 
a team which has really been working uh, to keep the universe flowing, uh, to allow it to grow. And then the most important part when you get a creative enterprise like this is that as you're allowing it to grow, it also has to feed back to everybody who is working on it to make sure that we know what's going on so we know where all the, where all the possibilities are. And so it's, it's really um, very much of a team effort. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a, there was a point uh, about 10 years ago um, where we kind of lost some of that. Uh, but over the last six or seven, uh, that really has come back very strong. We've kind of rebuilt that culture. We've had a couple of, a uh, couple of the old summit meetings that we used to have. Um, and because of the success of the Kickstarter, um, we've also had the opportunity to uh, do a lot more in the way of fiction. We have Shrapnel Magazine now. Uh, so, and it's there for short fiction or for serialized novels, um, which is just a, a, a very cool thing. Um, uh, we also, they've got a, a full-time editor uh, uh, in John Helfers, who's an editor I've worked with for many, many, many years. And wow, the uh, covers on these are incredible. Oh yeah, uh, you know, I mean, it's and and that magazine is a full glossy, you know, uh, it, it, full magazine full of really good stories, uh, written by all sorts of different writers, um, and it really uh, the last couple of issues have been themed issues. Uh, so I think issue sixteen that I had a story in was the mercenaries issue. Um, and that's something which is, you know, that is a, a project which is ongoing. Um, they also do some stuff which is ebook only, uh, or, you know, initially will be ebook and then may combine a bunch of novellas into, uh, uh, into a physical book. Um, so the, the, the fiction side is really vibrant. And the reason that that's uh, necessary is um, historically when Battletech has done best is when the, fiction has been deciding where the universe is going to go and the game product comes in to fill that out to allow people to gain into that uh and so we're we're very much back into that model now and and uh i'm really enthusiastic uh really excited i just came back from gen con and i i mean i've got a, a list you know a list as long as my arm of uh, of projects that i need to do and and set up uh you know, brian young and i are doing a graphic novel um you know it's just all sorts of things we were never able to do before and we're going to be able to do now so. that's awesome yeah well there's a certain theme in, in some of your work especially with the battle tech and with the uh, rogue squadron you know, i was reading that and i've read a lot of star wars stuff over the years you know uh, but that was i don't think anything i've read really made me feel like i was in that cockpit <laughs> <laughs> of an x-wing i mean the, the the details that you put in there i mean it's amazing i mean you make it seem like this is a you know like <laughs> is it like a jane's book of <laughs> x-wing you know somewhere i mean how do you wow i mean you really know what you're talking about in these books well you know it's it's, it's what any writer does for anything is, is you have to do a lot of research so taking the x-wing books for example um, you watch the movies over and over again, and especially going through and having to go frame by frame to find out what the control surfaces are, uh, uh, for the different things, or, you know, when, when Wedge says lock attack foils, you know, S foils into attack position, what does he hit to do that? You know, and it's like, okay, he goes up here and he hits that switch you know and and so literally taking the scenes apart to know to know what it looks like and then again with the x-wing books um uh we had the x-wing the x-wing computer game and the pie fighter computer game mm -hmm. so those helped a lot uh to to get that feel of being in a cockpit um but then there was talking to pilots reading pilot autobiographies watching uh uh, a lot of documentaries about squadrons, how they're formed, you know, all of those things, watching documentaries about 
how you fly things, uh, especially acrobatic, uh, acrobatic flying and, and things like that. And just taking tons of notes, reading all these books to figure out all these details because I, you know, I, I'm not really worried about the person who's never been in an airplane reading the, the X-Wing books and wanting to know if their experience is realistic. I'm worrying about the guys who've flown in combat, reading mm -hmm. those books, saying, this is it, the guys got it. Yeah, You know, and, and I literally, when those books were coming out, I remember I would talk to pilots and they'd say, oh yeah, yeah I've read those books. What do you fly? And, 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 and my response is I fly coach. Um, Cause I, <laughs> you know, I just don't, I, you know, I, I, I don't fly. Um, you could have fooled me. <laughs> well, but, but it literally is, you know, in, in doing the research to get it absolutely right. And, and, and one of the things, so in the X-Wing book, one of the real subtle things um, is that in my research, one of the things that was talked about in, in uh, squadrons is that uh, most pilots die in their first five fights or after 15 fights. And when a new guy came into your squadron, you wouldn't want to get to know his name. You wouldn't want to get to know him. The chances were he was going to die. And in a squadron, you'd lost enough friends already. And so if you go back through Rogue Squadron, one of the things you will see is that Wedge never addresses any of the new pilots by their first names until the end of the book. Hmm. Because he did not want to get to know them. And, and, and I did that very deliberately because that's the way he would be thinking about this stuff. You know, mm -hmm. that's that, you know, he would, he could address Admiral Akbar, he could address General Psalm, he could address Tycho because he'd had enough time with them. He knew they'd survive, but none of these other guys. Did he think they would survive? You know, and that's just that's self-preservation for that character. And it's and if you look again, if you look at Wedge, you know, emotionally, he doesn't begin to open up really until the third book. And even then he doesn't have much of a chance. And then it took Aaron's books to be able to fully open him up. I mean, you know, you look at those, you look at those uh, X-Wing novels, all 10 of those X-Wing novels as Wedge's story, or you look at his story arc. You know, it is going from being someone who is only known fighting to becoming something more. Uh, and and it, I'm enormously, enormously proud of that and also really proud of what, what Aaron did, you know, because Aaron, Aaron picked up what I was laying down and, and going. And, and that is the best when you're doing tie in work and it's it's like, you know, uh, uh a bunch of jazz musicians just to just getting together and jamming uh you know and each of us picking the parts out of what everybody else is doing paying respect to them uh and then having them uh having them go forward is is um it's just a lot of fun yeah these are great i got 10 yeah. i got quite a bit of reading ahead of me <laughs> oh yeah 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 i just at the start of the journey but yeah, really, really about probably about nine tenths the way through the first one. And that's what really struck me was because you know, I always thought about Star Wars as kind of being a little bit softer, you know, for, for science right. fiction and Star Trek. And I'm like, not this book. <laughs> well, they, they, I mean, literally, it, this is it as hard as it gets here. I mean, you got details in there that, wow. Well, that's why they, but that's why they fly worse in the atmosphere. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, it, it, it all it, makes perfect sense. You know, there's nothing of. Uh, I never get to like. Oh, this is this is. You know, half the time I'm watching something science fiction, you're like, "Oh, that's ridiculous." They don't know what they're right. talking. About. I mean, this is the most. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't have enough of a physicist to know if there are inaccuracies, but it certainly seems more realistic than anything else. Well, it was as close as I could get to realism as as you know, because there and again, there are little subtle things. Um, you, you'll you'll notice that we talk about fuel. We never talk about what the fuel is. Oh, okay. you know? and so and and you know, and so you're dealing with you know you're dealing with the with the uh, universes, and it's like, look, 
It's never been specified, so I'm not going to specify. I have to deal with this situation. I have to deal with a fuel situation. So, you know, uh, so this is going to be here. Don't worry. We can fake the math, uh, you know, and we can make it we can make it work otherwise. Um, but literally, you know, when I got the call, it was, you know, we want you to do military science fiction in the Star Wars universe. And I got a second call saying, and you'll probably want to use Wedge Antilles. And it was like, OK, here we are. You know, this this is what you wanted. Here we go. So. That must have been great. Yeah, I like the de one of the details that stood out to me was you have the uh, one of the droids, you know, the back of the X wing, and I always wonder, like, how does they how do they communicate, you know, with the pilots? And you have a little thing where it shows up on the display of the inside the cockpit, and I'm like, oh, yep. you know. And then I started look watching for that in the movies, and I do notice, you know. Yep. So it's like helping me appreciate details that I, you know, I never would have even thought about that. <laughs> yeah. So. It's you know, it's just, it's, it's, um, again, many, many watching of the movies, many, many um, notes being taken. <laughs> I think it'll, I think it'll help people appreciate the, every, the whole movies and the books even more. Wow. We've covered a lot of, a lot of ground here. Uh, do you want, I do have a question or somebody was asking about Bard's Tale 3. Thief okay. of Space. You want to quickly touch on that? I don't know if. Uh, um, yeah, maybe it's a longer did, story. I don't... <laughs> no, no. After we did, after we did, um, uh, Wasteland, uh, uh, Interplay had done Bard's Tale and Bard's Tale Two, right? And uh, the original designer, I think it was Mike Cranford, yeah, uh, was kind of moving on, and there was uh, a demand for uh, uh, Bard's Tale Three. So um, they hired me to go ahead and do the uh, uh, do the design, um, and um, and it, so it was a lot of fun putting things uh, in Barstale Three. Uh, as you go through the adventure, um, you're not only moving spatially, but you're moving through time. Uh, so, you know, and, and, and the way you would know is you would meet a you would meet an NPC, uh, and the first time you meet the NPC, they're middle-aged and they know who you are and they act like they've been around you before. And the next time you meet them, uh, they're incredibly young and they don't know who you are and they're brash and, and, and all those things, but now you know who they are. And then, uh, again, to, to give them that full emotional journey. As you go into the final map, um, you run into a skeleton, and it is that NPC who's mm -hmm. been dead, obviously, for centuries. And now the player is going, you know, well, now I've got to avenge, you know, I've got to avenge this guy uh, because, you know, I've run around with him before. Uh, and and so that was uh, that was fun stuff to. Uh, to most people have to consider that the best of the original series, the third one. And you you probably worked with Becky Heineman on that, or I did, I did. Yep. Yeah, she was really proud of it. Yeah, she was. It was funny because she was in doing in doing things she programmed. She was she had a habit of of uh, putting into. Uh, hidden sectors, you know, little graphics and other things. And I really did not want that in this game. And I found out that Becky was a fan of Fred Saberhagen. And Fred was a friend of mine. And so I got Fred to autograph a book uh, to Becky um, and brought it over with me one time when I went over to Interplay. And I said, look, don't screw up with this game. This will be yours. And uh, you know, so <laughs> the, oh wow, I haven't heard this story before. <laughs> yeah, oh, I don't think anybody knows that story. So. <laughs> well, I assume it worked. I it, apparently not that I would know how to edit sectors to find okay. out, but yeah, I think it worked. That's fun stuff. All right, Mike, I don't want to keep you keep you anymore. I've been very generous with your time. Well, this was fun. Yeah. Now you got some corgis and you got some work you do with skeptical 
uh, skeptic skeptics association i don't know if I, well yeah I, I i used to i used to be a big time skeptic here in town uh, and that's kind of kind of gone the way of just as other things you know i think at the time that ended i m moved on to the game manufacturers board and then i left that a couple of years ago I left that just before covid um and that's uh so just me and me and my work uh so, yeah, I like the I read the amazing Randy's book not too mm -hmm. long ago, Flim Flam, and of course, uh, uh, why am I blinking on the name of Contact? What's that? Uh, 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 Demon Haunted I'm World. Saying. Yeah, I've read his stuff. It's it was good, but yep. all right. <laughs> was well, there anything you. else you well, wanted well, to plug or anything you're working on that we didn't cover here? I, you know, I think I think um, uh, we started off at, at looking at Scratch, looking at my Patreon project. Yeah, and, I was thinking uh, back to that. You know, folks are folks are welcome to take a look at that. And I then, think this uh, is probably say, the best value you're going to find, folks, because I mean, this is lots of con. Fifty six of these. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff sitting there, um, and uh, they'll probably be fifty seven. Will probably come out in in August. Um, so uh, but uh but yeah so um yeah i've been are, a, one that i was there, reading the, you had a little note at the start kind of an author's preface i guess or a little update sort of what's going on <laughs> right and you talked in there about how you authors you heard a lot of authors say well i don't know where this is going to end up or <laughs> if that so that kind of circle all the way back to the very first part of this chat you know so yep you got lots of stuff to read. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I have been somewhat very prolific. thoughtful guy. Well, it was, it was funny. I, this last weekend, I was at a at a writers conference in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Salt Lake City, and I had given a talk on how to write a series. You know, yeah. so things you want to set up, things you want to look at, all these things. And uh, a guy who'd come in late, I had introduced myself at the beginning of the class. Guy had come in late, he came up to ask me some questions at the end of the class. Um, and then he said, so basically his question was, who are you to be telling us how to write series? You know, baby, I've never heard of you. <laughs> and there was another guy who was sitting there taking notes. Uh, we were the only three of us left in the room. And he just looked up and said, I took a class from him two years ago and I looked him up. He's something of a big deal. <laughs> um so it's nice when you have a student saying, yeah, you know, you've done oh. some work. You know what you're talking about. Wow. Yeah, I think I heard you say you've got 60-something books. I think it's now 70. 70 somewhere books? In, yeah, yeah, somewhere in, yeah. somewhere in that area. Yeah. Wow. It is It is a few. You're prolific. <laughs> yeah. That's more, that's got to, you must do about two or three a year, I guess. Huh? Uh, you know, it, I mean, it depends. Uh, all I care about is, is I've done more books than I've been alive uh, for years. So, uh, you know, so I like the record is on that. Oh, geez. I mean, you know, guys like uh, I mean, a, a friend of James Randi's was uh, Walter Gibson, who wrote the shadow, uh, the the novels about the character of the shadow. He wrote two 50,000 word novels a year for or a month to a month for 14 years so that's ethic the work of yeah. yeah i get students complaining about a couple hundred words you know yeah yeah exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> this guy's written 70 bucks okay i'll let you get back to that writing all right thank you very much Thanks again this has been awesome thank you yeah yeah i enjoyed it thank you I'll certainly post links to every all the stuff we talked about here so hopefully we'll get you some new patrons <laughs> that, that would be great yeah okay all right well, thank look, you very much keep in touch okay we'll do bye bye and ah, that's all for this week's episode i hope you guys enjoyed that uh should be back really soon probably have julia on from the crimson diamond game I'm hoping to get her on soon. Uh, hopefully within the next couple of weeks we'll see her and hear about this new game she just launched. Uh, really fantastic stuff if you are a fan of EGA graphics and that whole uh, era of uh, adventure games, which I'm pretty sure you are if you like this channel, so stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you very, 
very, very, very much for supporting me, my poor little Matt Chat channel. Thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness, the thanks. Are you feeling the gratitude? <laughs> it's, com it's coming at you in waves. Yes, thank you for keeping this show on the, on the air, folks. Really means a lot to me. Uh, people going to my link there in the show notes to the Patreon page, becoming a Retron part of the team, getting access to that Discord, behind-the-scenes stuff, extra bonus uh, material. So uh, if you've already signed up, thank you for that. Uh, again, you have my eternal thanks. Uh, if, for whatever reason, you have not done so, you know, <laughs> take my advice. Click a few links. Takes a few seconds, a few minutes of your time. Uh, you can sign up whatever amount of money uh, feels right for you, you know, to make your own decision uh, on that front. But whatever you do to support the show, just know I appreciate it and thank you. Remember, you can't spell gratitude without rat. So ponder on that, yeah. All right, what about that news from the Met Cave? Do we have any news for you? Yes, I think we can supply. Uh, Miko, good old Miko, another one of the fabulous people that you'll meet if you sign up to become a patron, Patreon, <laughs> and check out our Discord channel. You'll get to see uh, Miko and chat with him. Always up with the latest and greatest news of interest to Matt Chatters. Uh, anyway, let's see what Miko has for us this time. Uh, so, Mr. Fargo, Brian Fargo, uh, who I've had on the show a couple of times, good. Uh, so he's also a, a big supporter of the show, by the way. Great guy. Anyway, after 20 years of patience and negotiations, RPG veteran Brian Fargo has bought back a lost hall of memorabilia from Fallout, Baldur's Gate, and more. I even saw some stone keep uh, stuff in this, this uh, collection. Uh, so he's comparing it to the show Storage Wars. <laughs> but this is for uh, all the stuff that uh, Brian has worked on over the years. Lots of awards there, clippings, promotional stuff, big posters, just all kinds of uh, wacky items uh, that you'd probably love to have in your collection. <laughs> oh, yeah, Brian, if you got a few extra things, uh, you don't have enough space for them, you know, I could probably find a place from them here in the humble Matt Cave. Let's see what else it says here. Yeah, he's got a quote. He was uh, looking at some, uh, some of these awards he won, and they were awarding him for selling... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, anywhere from 50, 50 to 100,000 units, uh, you might get an award for that. Uh, whereas now, he says, it would be the end of your career <laughs> if you had those kinds of numbers. Uh, so it's kind of uh, eye-opening to think about how big this industry has become. and Really not that long of a period, kind of explosive. Uh, but anyway, that's a lot of fun. Uh, definitely go check out um, the tweet stream. You can see pictures of all this stuff. It's really, really cool. Uh, and then Miku also writes in about a game called Heroes of Might and Magic, Olden Era. Olden, O-L-D-E-N, unveiled at Gamescom, releasing on PC and Steam Early Access in the first half of 2025. What is Olden Era? Olden Era, not quite sure how to pronounce Let's just go with Olden Era. <laughs> uh, so this is before the events of the first, uh, first game. Takes players back to the world of Inroth and the continent of Jadame. Jadame? Uh, anyway, has new factions, biomes, creatures, and I uh, made a note of a few other things here. Let's see. Uh, yes, some new features. Uh, so players will have more control over how they level up their heroes and their factions. With faction-specific abilities, new systems for learning skills, magic spells, and artifacts uh, that impart bonuses if you equip an entire set. And so some pretty cool new features. Looking forward to this. That is Heroes of Might and Magic Olden Era. So will it compare to the earlier games in the franchise? We will have to wait and see. But hope springs eternal. All right, what else do we have here? Tired Gaming Dad. I thought this was really cool. Uh, so you know who Sid Meier is, I hope. <laughs> you know, I want to get Sid Meier on this. Wouldn't it be awesome to have a chat with Sid? If anybody knows uh, Sid Meier, uh, can we get him on the show? Uh, can you set that up for old Matt Barton? Yeah, I Love the chat with Sid. Uh, but anyway, he's got, uh, or Firaxis has preserved his, uh, the computer that he worked on when he was making Civilization. I think, was this the first Civilization? 
Uh, I'm not sure about that one. But anyway, he was uh, working on this. Uh, this is the computer that he used. It was a Compaq Desk Pro 386 PC in 1991. It packs uh, 16 megabytes of RAM. And you'll never guess how much this thing cost back then. It was $10,000. Now, I'm not sure. I should have looked into this. I don't, I don't know if they mean $10,000 back in 1991 money. or we, Is that adjusted for inflation? Because <laughs> if that's not, in, I mean, that's, a pretty, that's already pretty expensive. But if that's not adjusted for inflation, wow. Uh, really shows you how expensive computers were back, back then. Uh, but anyway, this is pretty cool. Uh, we're going to have Civilization 7 coming out soon, February 11th, 2025. Really looking forward to that. Uh, and I also made a little additional note here from the article. So apparently he had two of these computers, uh, but uh, when he tried to boot up one, it exploded. <laughs> so, so scratch that one. Uh, but thankfully the second one survived and has been preserved, and you can go see it. Uh, it's pretty cool stuff. All right, let's wrap it up with a quotation. And uh, it's not hard to find a quotation when you have an author on the show. <laughs> You'd think Michael A. Stackpole would be good for a quote. And, of course, he's got lots and lots of great quotes. But uh, I really like this one. It goes something like this. If you can't recognize the man in the mirror, it's time to step back and see when you stop being yourself. Pretty deep stuff there. So, anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that. Now, see you guys next time.